Hello and welcome to Colors of the Dark. I'm your exhausted co-host Rebecca McKendry and with me is Elric Kane and we are coming off a burner month of October of traveling, conventions, events, everything, but we're ready to talk about all of it because it's been a hell of a month. I call this our Halloween hangover show because Halloween was last night and so I am still uh, getting through the sugar highs of it all but I'd also say this is the closest I've wanted to quit everything in life uh stop that th- th- stop this that month, no, this month just it ran me I think too many podcasts I'm not not just this one obviously uh but let's jump right in because we did just do we do want to direct people people said oh do you guys have a Halloween episode this year well not exactly but we did record for five hours uh, we did a screen, screen draft drafts. of ranking every single Halloween movie. So if you've never heard their Why? show, please go listen because we all worked very hard on that. Yes, defense. that is what they call a mega draft, yeah. I believe is their technical term for it, um, where it was us, Graham Skipper and Billy Ray Bruton. And over the course of fucking five hours straight, we drafted and ranked every Halloween movie to date. And so that was um that was that was hell, but we made it through. It was a lot longer than we thought. And but it was fun and it's a really interesting episode. I don't want to reveal uh, remember when I walked onto that show and my very first thing I said was, You have two hours, because that's what I paid the babysitter for. And Oh God. Well, speaking of which, it's a good segue. So go listen to that as a good segue. You'll start to notice our goal in our life is making one hour show. We've talked about it for 10 years. 10 years, (laughs) we have discussed the idea of our podcast being one hour. And recently it's been ballooning. Wait, it's like a sweet time. Like that's what I listen to on my commute. It's the the normal podcast. It's like one hour. Um, we just like to talk. So we're aiming for that tonight, y'all. We're going to get so many tweets when this bad boy goes on for like three and a half. No, Ernie, it it's, Ernie, it's don't let us go past it. No, we're, we're, we're doing, doing it. it. We're doing it. This is going to be the new shape of the show because otherwise yeah. 10 years is a lot of time to talk about horror. So I think trimming it will only make us more, you know. Make us tight. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, okay. Should we so talk the about next that thing... for 30 more minutes? Just about the length? 30 the more show. minutes discussing the show formatting. I feel we need to. Um, okay. So the next thing that we did in addition to that five hours we spent drafting all the Halloween films. We went to freaking Knoxville for the most awesome film festival. We went to the Knoxville Horror Film Fest um, two weekends ago and saw some amazing movies. But we also got to hang out with Fred Decker, which was awesome. You can hear our interview with him over on our Patreon channel, Deep Cuts. And um, we got to see Halloween 3 at the drive-in, which was really awesome. Yeah, he, I, I found out he was a fan of uh, that film, which was super cool. Yeah, Fred was great. Yeah. We did a fun show with him. That will be available on the normal feed in a couple weeks, but we're putting it out early uh, just as a kind of a bonus. But we put it out a month or so early on our Patreon. Uh, we also brought down Brian Sauer from the other podcast, Pure Cinema. And we just, it was a fun time. We got to watch movies, got to talk movies, met some great listeners. Uh, let's let's breeze through some of these. One, one thing I want to do with like these films, films because some of them don't even have distribution yet is you know it's always hard like i don't even know if i rate some of these on letterbox when i'm watching them because i'm like i don't yeah because some of these still don't have yeah. distro yet so you kind of want to wait till that happens but we still yeah we want stuff. them to get the best distro that they possibly can so we're not going to say too much about them yet because we don't want to predecess much press yeah. that's going on um but we can definitely jump in first one that we watched that i was super excited about straight out of the gate where the devil roams this is from the adams family and uh um, we had seen them before with Hellbender. There was another one they did. What was it called? Uh, the one I, d- when I personally like discovered them, like just myself, I was like, oh, it was called Digging, The Deeper You Dig. Uh, the Deeper You and Dig. I really like that I- one. That's still probably my favorite, weirdly enough, because it's very simple and about a missing girl. And Hellbender was theirs, right? Oh, yeah. I'm Hellbender's right before this. Uh, yeah. Hellbender's okay. Right, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is their new one. I had a blast with this one. Um, this one, it is about a, a murderous family of carnies um, who kind of roam the country. And specifically, uh, there's one, their daughter, who is played by their actual daughter, Zelda Adams, um, who discovers this man at the carnival who claims that he can cut his fingers and that they will regrow the next night. And that's kind of the carnival's biggest sideshow attraction. And she discovers the secret of what he's doing. And uh, so it's kind of these two storylines of him and the murderous Carney family collide in this very stylized way. Um, It's got a really good backstory to it, too, kind of how it's all taking place. So yeah, highly, highly stylized. Um, And again, the family is just amazing. The mom of the family, Toby Poser, she is just 
uh, such a good actress really such great a good actress. really great actress mm-hmm. and i can imagine her crossing over into like just other stuff as well um but zelda's great too really? zelda has just a great look the the daughter and she co-directs them all uh this one is yeah it's very stylish it's almost experimental and it is experimental in terms of lots of different techniques lots it's of really styles. expressionistic yeah, yeah they're pulling a lot from like 1920 He's like Caligari cinema, so it's really expressionist. And it, because it's a period piece on still a very their same kind of low budget, it's a big swing. Some parts work better than others in that, but anytime it was like black and white, it really I was like, whoa, that really works and and pops. Yeah. But yeah, look out for this one. This one does have or at least some distro through Yellow Veils putting it out. Uh, but definitely look out for it. And I think their reputation now is really growing, so people will will yeah. find this one. Um, what's next? Black mold. So oh, wait, you um, skipped one. We I, I thought Frog I Man did? was next. Frogman, yes, Frogman. Um, I love the team behind this yeah. one. It's Anthony Cousins and producer Zach Locke. I had already seen this one at the Lovecraft Film Festival. Um, and this is based on an actual legend out of Ohio. I didn't write that down. I should have. I forgot where. Um, I was, believe. Actually. Yeah, I, I, I was. I think it was Ohio. No, it felt like up. Portland or somewhere. I felt like they were in the Pacific Northwest, but I can't. Oh, it may actually be because yeah. I saw it in Portland. So Ohio might be incredibly wrong, but it is a real legend that exists in some region about this giant frog man. Um, and so this is a modern day found footage film about a kid who sees Frogman when he's a kid that's because what he kind of becomes known for to the point of notoriety where people kind of make fun of him for claiming to have seen Frogman when he was a kid so he grows up and decides he's going to make a film and go find Frogman again yeah because in the opening scene he sees it as a little kid and then there's really fun like merchandising and just they really sell the legend well I think your your mileage with this movie will vary on your feelings of found footage found footage appreciators are going to jump right in and know the problems all found footage films have which is like why are you filming why are you doing the, this the setup is always the hard part what i will say where it delivers and where it needed to deliver is in like a 20 minute sequence towards the end when shit goes wild when you start getting yeah. to the apex of this movie and i think that that sequence is as good as anything in any of the vhs like i could imagine that being in the vhs uh segment you know because yeah the uh, last 20 minutes of this were utterly bonkers and it is ohio it is oh, called the loveland frog and it's based in ohio oh so maybe that's the real legend but maybe the film wasn't based there i'm not sure i can't remember. yeah whatever i can't recall either but either way it was the last 20 minutes of the movie go absolutely yeah so for wild. found footage people definitely put it on your on your list because it does deliver i was tell, telling them there's just moments that are like going to be kind of iconic uh of crazy imagery uh oh yeah. frogman delivers um okay and, and then and then you were uh, take us where and then headed. that takes us i forgot because i went back and took a nap because i'd already seen frogman uh, okay. and then i got back to the theater in time for us to watch black mold and this um you know like two years ago i remember actually talking to somebody like how long till we get a horror film on black mold because mm-hmm. it was becoming like a hot news story at the time about black mold causing hallucinations and stuff like that oh that was a real well, story i didn't know that yeah, yeah, that is like, it was a real thing. Actually, I was um, working in a high school the first time I heard about black mold because they found it in some of the classrooms. And then it suddenly became like this, have you experienced? And it was like this list of medical conditions that were caused by black mold that some of the teachers were kind of, you know, saying that I have this because you let the school get to this point. And so like an asbestos um, type thing, but something that affects your mind. Even worse, like it was, um, well, no, not worse. I mean, asbestos causes cancer. Yeah. That's pretty damn bad. But black mold, it was like respiratory problems, joint problems, brain fog. Like it was just a whole host of things that can be caused by black mold because it is toxic. And so if you're breathing it in for hours upon hours at a time, it can become toxic. In this case, is really fucking toxic, which they explain in the movie why it is so fucking toxic. And um, this is about urban spelunkers, I'll call it. I guess they explorers? they explore. I don't know what it's called. Yeah, be explorers, um, urban explorers. They um, break into abandoned buildings and explore and take pictures. And um, the two main characters specifically are urban exploration photographers. Um, and one of them has become really well known. And so she's gearing 
gearing up to do this big kind of studio art show all about her urban abandoned explorations. And so they have decided to break into a rundown, I think it's a mental hospital of some type, but you get the idea that they're doing experiments there as well um, to take pictures and they're going to be in there for a long time. They don't, they want to keep a low profile. So they just have their friend drop them off. So they're basically out there, you know, they say like 17 miles outside of town, there's nothing around them. Um, no one knows they're there in this abandoned building where there's all of these other tests happening um, before it got shut down. And then when they get there, things start happening. And this is, it's got some really cool trippy moments. And as the characters weave in and we get the other characters backstory, this, this had some really interesting stuff to it. And I like the production team behind it, which includes um, Jill Gavizagarian. Yes, yeah, so the director of this, John Pata, was the editor for Jill's The Styles. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, might be on people's radars already. Yeah, uh, also Jeremy Holm, who plays the Ranger in The Ranger, who's really good in that. He's got a pretty important role in this. I won't tell exactly what it is, but it's there's a squatter in the building that becomes the focus of the drama. I don't want to ruin from there. I think the most impressive thing about this movie is just, I think, the directing style and the way the production feels makes up for yeah. some of the parts that are a little thinner on the story. I like just moments where you're like, but the style's always kind of carrying you through. And it's really good production value. Yeah, too, I think they're actually the shooting in like an abandoned, um, I think he said it was like a military base, um, but it's beautifully abandoned. Yeah. Like it's old and it feels, it really feels lovely. Yeah. Um, which brings us to the last one that we saw that night, which was Sacrifice Game. This is the new one from Jen Wexler, the director of The Ranger. Um, this one is about a girls' school that uh, it is it is Christmas time and all of the girls are going home for the holidays except for two. And it is about a uh, teacher who is staying behind with her uh, boyfriend who also works at the school and the two of them are going to watch these two girls over the Christmas holiday. And you get from the start that one of these girls is going through some family stuff, but that she's pretty social. She's like a, a, a very social girl um, who really just kind of, you know, wants to be away from there at Christmas. And the other one is someone who is very, um, she's quiet. She's very withdrawn. She doesn't really blend with the other girls at the school and nobody really pays attention to her. Yeah. The, so the setup of the, the opening shot of this is awesome. And it, the opening scene, it, is, it, it's, it's really something. Open. And it's, and it's like, shows that, you know, shows kind of her growth as a filmmaker, I think. And like uh, also getting to make a bigger movie because it's a bigger movie. Um, and it's pretty slick. Uh, it's really fun. There's a bit of, after that, there's a little bit of black coat daughter DNA in the setup, but not really what then happens. It's one of those genre jumping shifting movies which i think we yeah. don't want to say too much about because it keeps shifting but i think people are going to have fun I, from what i can tell it's done really well on the festival circuit so far so it feels like the kind of film a lot of people are going to be like seasonal because it's i think it's all christmas right yeah it's all christmas right. so it seems yeah. like probably that's when it's going to land and we can talk about it more once it's in people's you know shutter or wherever it's going um yeah. okay but yeah good job to team uh wexler um okay so that's and sean red yeah, as well wrote it with her, yeah. yeah um yeah. okay so that is the movies we saw outside of also seeing um halloween three halloween three at knoxville and knoxville in general just next year if you find that you are in the knoxville area during their horror film festival event it's an amazing time and i think that they do um drive-in events throughout the summer as well so definitely central cinema in knoxville it's a place to check out yeah now we have fun and we go down there because we like the people ultimately it comes down to the yeah. people and everyone treats everyone pretty nice down there so good times and and that's one of the few things that didn't burn me out this month like i, I think I'm, it's always hard traveling but I actually that always replenishes me a bit so uh yeah let's... that was it was a fun weekend and then i came back to 15 screenings yeah. and you know these talkbacks and at least these symposiums it, these are these are very much like champagne problems because i love everything i get to do it's just well, there's a lot of a student asked about. me yesterday why aren't you dressed up at school and i'm like dude every day is halloween for me like this is like i do not i've already dressed up as a as robot monster a week ago i don't need to do anything more i'm i'm good halloween's almost my day of most zen where i i don't do any of this stuff i just so that's my one of my students asked me yesterday what's the movie i watch on halloween and i was like great british baking show because this is like you know this is the day that I, by this time i have watched nothing but horror the entire month so by the time i get to halloween 
my kids are all sugared up. It's like 1030 by the time I get to bed. Great British baking show. No, it is. That's an interesting thing to hear people's tradition. For me, it's always something old. I, it's the only time I totally feel like an older, still hard, right. but usually it's like something black and white, like Black Sabbath happened to be on T Turner Classic. So I just, and I, I'd missed most of the first story, The Drop of Water, which is the best. But then I was just like, That's the best. but then I kind of started watching and I was like, you know what? I haven't seen the Vaderlec one for a while. And I just stuck it out and really enjoyed it and felt relaxed and felt Halloween-y. And then I'm good. You know, it's, I don't want to watch the newest cool thing. Uh, I think I'm good. I, I watched Great British Baking Show and fell asleep at like 11 o'clock last night so but i i feel better now so uh well we saw um, some other movies the same especially one that is the yeah. late entry in a massive franchise so we both saw saw 10 finally is that the one that you're yes. talking you, about i feel like we watched a couple probably, of things have you seen all um, the saw movies because i've seen all yes. the saw movies. okay i wasn't sure if you i have seen them okay it's one of those franchises where if you ask me what my favorite franchises are, for some reason, I would never say Saw, but I'm always excited when there's a new one. Um, and I will always watch them because I want to see how they connect or double back or young Jigsaw with his hat on backwards or how they're going to do it now and how it's going to be woven in. This one it definitely functioned as kind of a standalone where it didn't try to do any of that like doubling back on itself or making it you know well it's it still is wedged in between you know this one and this one um it feels like it's somewhere around the threes or fours where it's kind of like wedged in there yeah i thought it was between but two and three maybe two and three yeah, yeah. four by four he was dead because four had the autopsy um yeah because i remember four was his head on the scale uh. but yeah okay so somewhere in between, it was one of the early entries. They kind of wedged this in between. It's not one where it's going to jump a whole bunch of different time periods and explain why in three this thing was happening, but by four he'd planned this out. It's not quite that. It's basically like a standalone event. But the whole setup is that um, he knows he has cancer. He knows he is dying. He is doing everything he can. Um, while I love that while he's receiving chemo, he's like sitting there doodling jigsaw traps in a little notebook while he's getting chemo in the hospital. And he runs in to somebody who had been in his chemo group who is completely cured now. And this person says that he was cured by this miraculous thing that this man invented this amazing treatment and his daughter, this, this scientist's daughter has taken it globally and she is now doing this specific treatment down in Mexico and he gives John the information. And John goes down there and quickly discovers that the treatment isn't quite what he thought it was. At this point, it was basically like Andy Kaufman's Man in the Moon. Oh, yeah. Um, That's a great and scene. Then, I know the way you're talking about it. And then it goes, it gets, um, and so Jigsaw decides to take his revenge out on the people who are doing this treatment and every single person involved. And, and that's where kind of the more um, oniony layered puzzle happens because you realize kind of how far back the con goes and all the different people involved. Which in it. that part reminded me a little bit of one of my favorite movies of all time, The Game by David Finch. I love that film. Yeah. And that part, like everyone played a part. I'm like, that's cool. I, I think Tobin Bell's excellent in it. I think it yeah. gives him a it feels like a more of a real I don't want to say real in quote marks but like uh, in terms of structure because it's not flashing forward flashing back all the time like some of the soul movies have to do it, it feels like you're just watching more of a character study for a while mm -hmm. uh and then it kind of has to move into hyper gear suddenly you know once it has to become a soul movie you know it kind of has to yeah it, it goes where the you first step yeah, the first act of this is is kind of what we led you through. And it is very much a character study of a man who has cancer and his desperation to kind of cure his cancer. And it is very much just all about John, the character. And then it becomes, goes back and becomes the Jigsaw movie after that. But um, I liked this. The thing that did not hit with me as much is that I didn't find the traps as exciting. All of them. The first trap, yeah. the trap in the cold open. With the eyes. Fucking awesome. On the poster, the so eyes. it's not a, not a spoiler. Though. It's really cool. That scene was really it's cool. The, it's what's on the poster. That is the cold open. That happened and I was like, oh, fuck, yes, this is great. And then the rest of the traps, I was not as in as that first one or maybe it was just that the first one so was so good that by the time it got to you know this is going to split your head open i was kind of like um that's yeah but that's not the eyeball sucker 
that's that's like a trap and um he's on so the yeah, fly some remember of them... once he's in mexico he doesn't have his normal lab he's kind of on the yeah fly. that's true he's just having to he's improvise happened to like macgyver mm-hmm. shit together last minute while he's there you know he doesn't have his normal access to supplies i get it i get it john but um yeah so that was my, like my only downfall it, with this but it's yeah otherwise it was fun it was very watchable it's gotta I, I i've always we have to one day look through all the numbers but it's got to be one of the better part tens. like like <laughs> if you really look at friends because it's better than the last three or four right so it's like it's it is no that is true I, kevin gritchett does a really good job making there were good. parts of spiral i think that was the last one parts of um it, that yeah. Yeah, that I didn't mind. Like there was moments where it got kind of trippy that they were trying to do more interesting stuff with it. There was a knee nail thing where he had to like push his knee yeah. down on nails that I remember being particularly agonizing. Um, or maybe it was a nail gun. And there was something with nails mm. and knees. But yeah, as far as part 10s go, really fucking watchable. Yeah, yeah no, I think it's good that it got, that people were enjoying it. And it got excited. Um, yeah, and Kevin Grutert directed this one really nicely uh, put together. So you have not yet seen Five Nights at Freddy's, correct? I have not. My kids were trying to watch it last night, and then it was really late when we rolled back. So I have not seen it yet. So you're going to have to limit your conversation. Yeah, well, obviously, it makes to- if you've seen The Wind, it makes total sense that that person would go on to make Five Nights at Freddy's. It's a right? direct, I mean, it, direct to obvious. You're like, oh, already, already, you know, uh, uh, Supernatural Western. You should be doing Five Nights at Freddy's, Emma Tommy. Uh, I think she does actually does a really good job. Look, this is a, I see a lot of uh, adults or people saying they don't like this or other people. This film did crazy good business. It was day and date. Uh, it came on Peacock. And all I'm going to really say is I didn't, I can't really tell you how I felt about it. Cause I was watching it through two kids and the kids who are horror scared kids who aren't, uh, haven't wanted to watch horror films did want to watch this. And when they watched it, they both loved this coming off their monster squad viewing a couple weeks earlier, that kind of opened the gates, I guess, for, for one of them in particular. And now Freddy's is the favorite film. And he's talked about it nonstop watched a second time because it is day and date. And so for people who like complain, I would say that what we want, for horror is for it to always be around and if the next generation fall in love with it with this a movie like this uh yeah. then it just is a guarantee that you're just making every you know decade you're making more horror fans so i i did enjoy it i thought what was interesting all i'll say is it's very dark in terms of the backstory it is more like a sequel to black phone than what i was imagining so the actual story is very grim and I was like, huh, I wonder how that's going to be processed by kids. But they've seen so much crazy shit in their real life now, um, in my opinion. But the actual the actual uh, effects and the uh, the animatronics were awesome. And so, you know, I really enjoyed watching it with them and seeing that they liked it. I, it's a little hard for me to watch it. If I'd gone on a Friday night by myself, I have no idea. But I don't know if I would have because <laughs> these are the kind of movies I, tr- I try to wait to watch with, you know, kids. But so I think big thumbs up for me in terms of gateway horror for youngins if you're wondering and and it comes nice. out of a lot of like there are still a couple scenes that are pretty like crazy in terms of almost going gore but t- it tends to cut before that moment uh there's pr- you know who knows maybe there'll be an unrated version someday but uh josh hutcherson from um hunger games is in it he's the star so you know that obviously brings in a lot of young people matt lillard mary Stuart masterson so it's you know a fun cast uh but you know i actually i had a good time so uh, i'm sure i'll hear hear about it on the uh on the social web when people get mad that i liked uh five nights freddy but hey kids dug it yeah now have you played the games yet because like my kids Knew love nothing. security breach so we've played five nights security or as they call it fast they have like a oh, yeah. FNAF, FNAF, that's yeah. it. They call it FNAF. No, I, I had the knowledge. Played it a lot. Zero. I just said that in the oldest way possible. Yeah. They have a thing like FNAF. Yeah. No, all I really knew about it was that I would see the toys and stuff at Target, and one of my kids was too scared to even look at them back in the day, like a couple years ago. Like couldn't even make eye contact because the because the doll like thing. And so it was a big step for that same kid now to watch the movie and be like, "Yep, I'm good," you know. Which is pretty cool. I brought one of the Five Night posters back from Knoxville because they were handing them out while we were in Knoxville at the theater and it's now hanging in Marnie's room. Um, But we were going to watch it on Friday night and then we ended up watching Scooby-Doo Zombie Island, by far the best of the animated Scooby-Doo movies. Um, That's my fave by far. There's a couple that are real good standouts, but I think that one's probably the best. So we got to circle back to Five Nights. I'll get it by next show. Um, But then... Two nights ago, I watched Sister Death, uh, which is Paco Plaza's new mm. one on Netflix. Um, this just came out uh, maybe a week or two ago to Netflix. 
This should have been everything that I love in the world because it is nuns. The entire thing is set in a convent and it's supposed to be like hyper scary and hyper bloody. There were parts of this that I loved. Other parts I can already say people are going to be a little put, put off by because it's slow burn, but it genuinely does have some really scary moments. I would not put it into nunsploitation category though. That's like the big question I was talking about with on socials because the nuns, it's not about the nuns doing naughty things. It's not not about them breaking their vows or suddenly having the scene where they, you know, seduce the man from town or anything like that. Um, it's not traditional nunsploitation. This is very much just a ghost story that happens to take place in a convent. And it is about this girl who, when she was a child, she believed that she saw the Virgin Mary. And the whole town believed her and it, she became known, um, like newspapers ran articles on her. And it was like this miracle girl who could see Mary and was like basically granting miracles for people because Virgin Mary was speaking to her. She is now grown up and she has become a nun and she has not had a single vision since that moment to the point that she is now questioning if she ever even saw Mary to begin with. Like, did I just hallucinate the whole thing? Um, and, and that kind of faith, that blind faith that she did see something has compelled her to become a nun, but she's now about to take her final vows and um, her vows of perpetuity. And is really starting to question if anything had happened or if she just kind of imagined the whole thing and the town just went along with it. And she has just moved into this new convent, and uh, which is also a school. So she's got a whole group of young girls there as well. And she's teaching grammar while she's there. And while she's in her room, she starts seeing things. She finds a box full of weird mementos from the nun who was there before, who she doesn't really know much about. She just knows that something happened and this nun left really suddenly. And what you find out is that there was a death. There's been a number of deaths at the convent. And that she starts seeing things and the girls are seeing things as well, but none of the other nuns believe them. They just punish them. As soon as the girls are like, I saw this thing, they just think that they're lying, that they're fucking around and they get punished. But she starts having these intense visions of what happened there and starts piecemealing things together. And so it's, it's a straight up kind of slow burn ghost story but it does have some really gory moments like it's got some really intense stuff that was kind of jaw dropping and it's it's you know set in a convent so I'm still going to watch it because it does the ghost is not exactly religious horror oriented as much as it's kind of in the backdrop of religion but it's still a really cool setting for a ghost story I think I read that it's a prequel to Veronica Really? Yeah, like I think is Taco it serious? Yeah, no, like I think it's I think it's intended as a prequel story to the Veronica movie Paco Plaza made that more modern. That so makes I, sense. I look it up afterwards, now. but I because I haven't seen it, I saw it come out and I looked it up and it, somebody wrote, "Yeah, this is his prequel to Veronica," and I was like, "Oh." It like does Veronica. not. It does not directly link, but it still roots itself in the same location. I'll have to go back and watch Veronica to see if there is a more direct link to it. Um, and I might be if wrong. If I'm like wrong, I apologize. But, tissue. You know. I'm going to Google that while you're talking. Um, um, but yeah, that makes sense just because he had done Veronica and it does have that same kind of feel to it. So yeah, I can now I'm curious if like all in some of the the scenes with the students or anything like yeah, that so been... do you go on i'm gonna quickly google yeah my that. last I'm new one uh that i saw was on shutter uh, called night of the hunted um and it's directed by frank calfon who made maniac uh the remake and ps2 uh and i like ps2 um this stars camilla rowe who is the actress from the deep house who i just eh, didn't quite get into her, her in the mm -hmm. deep house and this has a really good first 15 20 minute setup uh it's very phone booth it's basically uh a girl and this guy she's probably uh having an affair with pull into a remote gas station and the kind of back roads really late at night uh and she walks inside and she uh realizes that the person behind the counter has been shot and is dead and then suddenly she gets shot at from very far away we're talking like a sniper and now she's stuck inside the brightly lit uh convenience uh part of the gas station uh while the guy is unaware of it in the car he doesn't realize there's a shooter after that so it's very phone booth like and it's a fun exciting setup after that it becomes very talky 
uh, and very bogged down with the kind of things being said. It feels like a Twitter uh, scroll of uh, everyone's rants on Twitter because the you know the the bad guys just kind of saying so much and she's saying so much, and it's hard to maintain an idea like this. It's a very cool setup, worth checking out. Some people will like it more than others, but for me, I was a little like meh after the first twenty minutes just because of kind of where it headed. Uh, but that's Night of the Hunted, uh, and Frank Calfon's you know somebody works with Alex Zander Aja a lot. I think edited some of the early films. And I think Aja might even be a producer on this one. So, you know, it's going to be a little gnarly. Yeah. Um, some of the other, well, I will say really quick, I did Google and I completely missed it. Yeah. There was a character named Veronica. Um, there's a character that is mentioned in the film Veronica called the blind nun, um, sister death. Mm. And apparently she's mentioned in Veronica as well. So it's explaining her backstory. So I didn't even make the connection because I watched that movie six years ago, but that is awesome. And I really liked Veronica. So now that makes even more sense. This is much slower pace, but really mm. cool. cool. Okay. So other two, um, um, one more movie and then two quick things I'll mention. So Appendage on Hulu. I need you to see this, Kane, um, because this feels like a love letter to Henenlotter in the classiest way possible, which is a weird thing to say. This is directed by a USC grad. I was just on a panel with her a couple of days ago named Anna Slav. I'm going to say her name wrong. Slavkovic, um, Slavkovic, thank you, Anna Slavkovic, um, from, and this just came out a couple of weeks ago. It is about a girl who works in the fashion industry. She is in this high powered fashion house and she's trying to do everything she can to impress the guy who runs it, but he's very unimpressed with her. And one night she starts having this amazing idea. And at the same time, this lump starts growing on her side and it pops ahead. And then this little mutant thing pops out and suddenly she's left with this little mutant thing and it can talk to her and it feels so basket case and it just kind of escalates from there I don't want to give too much away but this it is shot like the classiest kind of horror film that you could possibly think of where it's very stylized and it's very refined and and just a very classical cinema style but it is about this girl who has had this twin this like mutant twin birth from her side and it insults her constantly that's part of it it's constantly insulting her and telling her how horrible she is and it basically feeds off her low self-esteem Wait, trash talking malignant Wait. Oh. it's a trash talk malignant it, it calls her bitch constantly and is telling her everything that's wrong with her but she doesn't know what to do with it and she's embarrassed of it and she doesn't you know know what to do and she's trying to hurry up to get these designs done and she's trying to impress her boyfriend so yeah it's it's a very classy shot um brain uh kind of mix of a couple of different hen and ladder films i'll say kind of come into this in varying capacities so this one, it's been mixed as you would expect a classy Hen and Lauder to be in the reviews, but I thought it was a lot of fun. Like this was the movie I needed this season because I was not expecting it in any capacity. So this is currently on Hulu called Appendage. I the saw, I saw it there and, and multiple times just passed it over because I was like, I don't know what that is because there's no advertising it's wild. for these movies. It's wild. No, and that was that's part of it is I did not even know this movie existed till I was placed on a symposium with the director. And then I was like, oh, if I'm going to be on there with her for like an hour, I'm going to watch her movie so I can ask her questions about it. And that's what I watched it. That was like, how was this not on my radar? It's a blast. And yeah, and it's got humor in it. It was just, it was a nice breath of fresh air because I was not expecting it in any capacity. Um, two quick book mentions. I finished What Kind of Mother by Clay McLeod Chapman, who's been on the show before. He was on last fall for his book, Ghost Eaters. This book is like super on brand for me because it is set in Virginia on the Chesapeake Bay, which is really close to my home. It is about, um, I'll say it's aquatic horror, but really Lovecrafty and aquatic horror with a lot of crabs and jellyfish and eels and stuff like that. It is about a woman who has moved back to her small hometown and is working as a psychic. And this guy that she had had a relationship with in high school shows up. And basically it's like, my kid has been missing. He went missing when he was eight months old. That was three years ago. I know he is still alive somewhere and I want you to find him. And 
that's the hook and it gets super lovecrafty and crabby weird so that was a blast i had a really good time reading this one clay mcleod chapman what kind of mother and then the last one that i want to mention because i read this on the plane on the way back from knoxville and had a blast with it brand new comic or it's graphic novel from stephen graham jones called earth movers volume one kill columbus and the hook of this is that basically the world has been destroyed like america the world in general has been destroyed like global warming wars like everything has broken down but we have perfected time travel and a group of native americans have realized that if they travel back in time and kill columbus it will basically undo all of the damage that has been done to humanity across the board and so they decide to, and one particular, so it bounces back and forth between the people in present day who are kind of trying to follow this and have sent the person back and are waiting for messages from him to appear in modern time, as opposed to the other storyline, which is the actual guy who has traveled back and is on Columbus's boat, um, trying to find a time to assassinate him without being caught. He speaks like five different languages. He's trying to blend in with everybody. This was wild and trippy and time travel-y. Just Stephen Graham Jones, you knocked it out of the park with this one. So yeah, that is called Earth Movers, Volume 1, Kill Columbus. Well, uh, that does sound fun. And I saw a little bit of over your shoulder as we uh, travel. Uh, you know, sometimes it's been a while. And in our, as we reformat, as we format, uh, you know, we missed a little thing called movie fight. Movie fight. So before we get into our final segment of the evening, we decided that we were going to have ourselves a lovely little movie fight. Movie fight. A very simple one because it's November 1st and people are, are getting ready for Thanksgiving, not sure what to watch. So we did a Thanksgiving slasher showdown in, in before the excitement is going to turn very soon to Eli Roth uh, releasing his Thanksgiving movie in only a couple of weeks, which is a crazy fast turnaround. That's like an eight month turnaround from from when the, it was like casting to being yeah. on screens. People are going to see it next week. I missed out on tickets, but they have a, a, a screening at the Egyptian. So or wherever, oh, like wow. one of those Beyond Fest type screenings. So anyway, so that's coming. But we wanted to hit you with a couple others that are comp- movie fight. I, was I hadn't for that. said no, it I know. Like I that. Like, I hadn't said it that way in a long time. I tried time. to tee I you up. To. I say it's soft, I had to so get it out. Loud, you know? Thanks, um, thanks. But yeah, these are totally opposite movies. They're both about 80 minutes long, so they there's some similarities. And we are going to pair up Blood Rage versus Christy. Christy. So Blood Rage, 1987. Why don't you queue up this one? Because I've only seen Blood Rage once. I've seen it a couple so, times. I actually watched Crystal I know. Today. I know you're a fan. Uh, yeah, I am. So uh, so Blood Rage, very different movie. Very, very much a party film, funny, crazy. Uh, you have a boy, uh, two boys at a drive-in. One of them ends up uh, c- committing a crazy murder and then handing the murder weapon to his brother and being like, it was him. So that brother gets institutionalized. Uh, and then this is set like 20 years later and it is on Thanksgiving. That brother is going to be released, uh, escapes. And the crazy brother, who, the one who hasn't escaped, it kind of triggers him to start killing again. Uh, so you get an actor playing two twins. You get a crazy performance by Louise Lasser, factor i call it uh there's great scene of her cleaning an oven there's scene of her eating takeaway on the ground i mean it's just it, there, it's something to behold um and you also just get some really wild death scenes um it's got no suspense at all because you know everything you know there's not there's nothing to hold back in terms of slasher film but it's very funny there's a scene where somebody's holding an old style beer and their hand is cut off and it continues to hold the beer. I mean, just it's got some classic moments like that, uh, but it's most famous for it's not the cranberry sauce. Yes. A classic line. So I saw this at a screening. Gosh, was it at the New Bev? I think it was Could at, have been the, at the Jump, like, jump Cup back then. Who knows? Oh, it, it may have I been. I saw this. I definitely the first time, the only time I've seen this, it was on a screen. And I have not seen it since then, but it is very much a bonkers Thanksgiving movie. Yeah. And we don't get a lot of Thanksgiving no. horror films. So that takes us to Christy. 
Christy was a direct to Netflix release. Um, I couldn't even believe this had been 10 years ago. This is Crazy. 2014. And I suddenly went, no, no, it was like two years ago. Like I watched this during the pandemic, right? No, it's almost fucking 10 years ago. And uh, time has just flown. And this is directed by Ollie Blackburn. And this is a girl who is left alone on a college campus over Thanksgiving. She has nowhere to go. And so she stays on the college campus over Thanksgiving. All the while, this group of people, serial murderers, are driving around and they're looking to kill girls that they think are, are kind of normal. They're calling them Christies. And they're any girls that are pretty and popular and have their shit together. And so it's this like roving group of, of serial murderers that are looking specifically for kind of college girls that they think fit this mold that they call Christies. And so they show up on the campus and she suddenly realizes that there is something, somebody in her dorm that is trying to kill her. And they keep calling her Christy the entire time. Her name's not Christy in it. But this becomes a really tight slasher, mostly with just four people. Like there's a security guard that comes in for a brief minute, um, but it's mostly just the, the, the killers and her. And it traverses multiple places on campus. Like it starts in the dorm, but it, it goes like there's a locker room scene that's really tight. And it's just a really tightly woven slasher, really well done that came out of nowhere in 2014 i feel like people who like sick or something like that would like it it's got a, the thing about all i remembered about it was that it was because i saw it like i think i saw it first when we were doing killer pv because i remember bringing it up like going what the hell was this and it was yeah. so tightly made that's all i really remembered i watched it today just ran i didn't need to for the show and i was like kind of curious and i couldn't stop watching it's on tubi it is it went way up in my estimation for a couple of reasons it's so well made and it just keeps going there's no fat to it it's just like they're chasing her and she's like resisting and then fighting back i think it's got a bit of your next as it changes like and what was so interesting for me though is uh the actress is Haley bennett and when i watched this i didn't know who she was the first time because she was new to the career uh she's the star of that movie swallowed she's fantastic like one of my oh my god and i didn't realize she's she was the girl great. so she's like one of those actresses i you know like who i just think fantastic now but you know so it's been 10 years obviously and james ranson who obviously is in all of scott derrickson stuff he uh is the guy who like works on the campus or something and he has one of the funniest like she like she catches up to him and she's like we're getting caught and we're gonna be killed by these guys blah, blah blah and she just keeps talking and he just goes i need you to really slow down because i'm real stoned and it, and the way he delivered it was like bam like he just nailed it so this is it, it really went up it's it's got good performances no bullshit real stylish and i realize it's a subcategory we've never talked about hoodie exploitation there, there is all these movies like where people are wearing them, being creepy um Ill. lake eden yeah there's quite yeah. a few of this in this area where it's ooh, wearing a hoodie makes you creepy um in this case it, it makes sense because they're just nobody's they're not like monsters or creepy things this functioned i remember the killers being like the strangers where it was yeah. just they were picking random targets but they didn't have the mask like you it felt kind of last house on the left where they were you didn't get their backstory they were just a group of psychopaths traveling around together yeah and there's a bit of an internet thing there that i had forgotten and there's like a, there's an internet web of people doing this all across the country so oh yeah it I gets a lot it was part of a larger yeah, network they never call them satanists but they're anti-god they believe they mm -hmm. really want god to die and to kill god they'll kill the christ-like girls who are called christies in their brain that was that stuff i'd forgotten so it was like anyway negative zero cranberry sauce in this movie zero nothing mentioned it's on cranberry not as funny now the question for me boils down to thanksgiving are you looking for something fun you're looking for something hyper scary and tense yeah like i could literally I, like personally i think this, these two movies are actually a, and this never happens on here are kind of a draw because they're so different i think they're both great for the season uh because they're just totally opposite movies and and christy was better than i had remembered but one we can't have a draw there's no draw one it's has to fight. win movie fight uh and you know Haley Bennett got to win in Christie, so she's gonna lose now because it's not the cranberry sauce. Come on, that's gonna it's be not the cranberry sauce. I was gonna say that honestly, even though Christie is a great movie after Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving is honestly one of the hardest holidays for me, or I find it to be the most intense yeah. because there's nothing to do. It's like Christmas, you can open presents, you know, cool, let's do this, you know, Christmas, let's make cookies. There's like things that you do. Thanksgiving, you show up, 
you sit around and talk with your family, which is where it's always going to get tense. Yeah. And then you eat and then you keep talking with your family. Like I always find Thanksgiving to be one of my most kind of cringy holidays. So with that in mind, after I have been through very cringy conversations about what I'm doing with my life and why I dedicated myself to horror and all of these uncomfortable situations, um, I'm ready for something light, fun, campy as fuck that I don't have to think about. So on Thanksgiving Eve, I'm always going to be ready for a blood rage over something hyper scary. Yeah, I think I think that's the right move. And I think it's also the movie that indulges in the Thanksgiving of it, the idea, the jokes, the camp of it. Uh, but Christy, hey, if you're alone, I think Christy's also a great college movie, great. like just a great yes. film to watch a girl running around a campus and uh, really fun. Both. You can't go wrong with either if you haven't seen either. But sorry, I mean, Christy's dead, Christy's so dead. we can't, yep. we can't, Game over. I'm sorry, she lived the movie to die here, so Christy, you, you're you dead to There's us, only blood, blood rage. rage, blood rage is on! Yeah, yeah I don't dead. know where you can order old style beer from in this part of the country, because I know in Chicago you can get it easily, I've tried, because I want to have an old style party and watch Blood Rage, but you know. We had a conversation about this, because what was the beer that you were drinking in Knoxville? Um, it's the one that uh, Quint Nagaset, Nag 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 or whatever. It's, it's Nagaset. It's what Quint drinks in Jaws and crushed the can. Because I was talking about how in Baltimore we had um, Natty Bow, and I was like, I can't get Natty Bow out in California. It was like the beer that I grew up with when I was in high school was Natty Bow, hey. and, uh, which is like natural bohemian. And I, yeah, so we got to find, we got to find a beer hookup. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, it's nice to have movie fight back because I did miss it. And um, I missed hearing you yell. Uh, and movie fight! Uh <laughs> But we also decided that we missed doing a deep cut on this show. So what we decided to do for our second half, which is going to be slightly abridged, um, is we decided that we would do our top five deep cut discoveries from our Patreon show, Deep Cut. So these are the top five discoveries. Now, granted, we drop four titles every show, yeah. four to five titles every show. So this is really having to kind of chisel it down to just five total. I was looking and over this year, I have probably watched a hundred movies for deep cuts. Yeah, no, it's just it's where... for the deep cuts Patreon show. So taking it down to five recent discoveries was, it was hard. Yeah, quite honestly, it's where I discovered my, fa it's where I tend to discover my favorite stuff each mm -hmm. year now is what we do for that show. Yeah, so part of it is to tell people about it. We have a deep cut Patreon show where we're doing all of that. So if you aren't on there, really, that is where a lot of our movie talk is happening. Um, the older movie, like weird exactly. shit that we're finding, yeah, that's the, where it goes. Yeah, this is why this show was always meant to be a bit more about what's happening uh, with new films. Um, and so then also we're going to rush through these because A, we're going to just be a lot breezier because we have talked about these on the other show, but this is more for the people who aren't to tell you, give you some breadcrumbs to go find some of these. So we'll yeah. kind of fly through them. Um, funnily enough though, all of mine have been on our show, except my first one I'm going to mention has not been mentioned yet because I saw it this week. Same. Oh, cool. Because I, I actually Same. saw it weird. I saw it four deep cuts and it was on my deep cuts. And then as soon as we were doing this, I'm like, well, it's going to be on this one because it's... Same. Oh, great. I watched one um, this week or it was last week. I watched it actually with you on the plane. Oh, right. I and I kept taking yeah. my headphones off going, this is so good. This is so good. And Brian and Elric are flanking me on either side on our plane. And I just kept going on about how good it is, but I couldn't tell them about it. And so I was, I was watching it for our deep cut show, but it was so goddamn good that it is on this list. It is like top of this list. So I'll get there, but let's count down. Yeah. we're And again, we'll be light because otherwise we will be uh, not hitting our anywhere near our mark. And this is our goal in life to win. Yeah, And I'll say really quick, our regular top 10 movies of the year episode will be our first episode in December. Yeah, it'll be so our, we're still, we're, we're going to get through all the, the, the November releases uh, before. We and, we, and if we watch a couple more cool discoveries, we'll mention them on yeah. that show between now and then. Yes. Tonight's show is brought to you by Factor Meals. If there is one thing that has been getting me through classes being back in session and spooky season being in full swing for the past couple of weeks has been Factor Meals. I've been eating these things for lunch for the past couple of weeks and they are saving me so much time. With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor. 
America's number one ready to eat meal kit can help you fuel up fast with chef prepared, dietitian approved, ready to eat meals delivered straight to your door. You save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Too busy this fall to cook, but want to make sure you're eating well? With Factor, skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the chopping and the prepping and the cleaning too, while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality that you need. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. So all you have to do is just heat and enjoy and then get back to crushing your goals. Adjust your stride this autumn without missing a step. Choose from 34 plus weekly flavor pack, fresh, never frozen meals, ready to eat in just two minutes. Level up with Gourmet Plus options, prepared to perfection by chefs and ready to eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. Too busy running around during the day to think about lunch? Keep your energy up with Lunch To Go. Effortless, wholesome meals like grain bowls and salad toppers that are ready to eat when you're on the go. No microwave required. Looking for calorie conscious options during the busy season? Try delicious dietitian approved calorie smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. Need an extra boost to support your wellness goals and feel your best as you tackle a busy autumn? Try Protein Plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. Round out your meal and replenish your snack supply with an assortment of 45 plus add-ons, including breakfast items like our delicious apple cinnamon pancakes, bacon and cheddar egg bites, and potato bacon and egg breakfast skillet. Or for an easy wellness boost, try refreshing beverage options like cold pressed juices, shakes, and smoothies. With Factor, you can rest assured you're making sustainable choices. We offset 100% of our delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for our production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in our meals. This September, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door, ready in just two minutes with no prep and no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash colors50. That is C-O-L-O-R-S-5-0. And use code colors50 to get 50% off. That's code colors50 at factormeals.com slash colors50 to get 50% off. Tonight's Colors of the Dark is brought to you by the new scripted horror podcast, Can't Relax. On the weekend before their ACTs, Anna and her friends download a new mobile relaxation app to take the edge off, unaware that it secretly plants murderous subliminal messages into the brains of its listeners. When people start dying, Anya must figure out who planted the corrupted malware on their phones and how to stop it before she herself becomes a killer. Starring Olivia Trujillo, Andre Robinson, Patrick Labrato, and introducing Penny Epstein. If you're looking for something scary to listen to while driving or doing dishes or exercising, this is it. It is super tense, but it's PG-13 enough that you can still listen with your tweens and teens. We are now six episodes in. We are having an absolute blast and we can't wait to keep listening. You can find the awesome and scary podcast, Can't Relax, anywhere you would usually go for podcasts. You can also discover all the Glisten Plus podcasts at www.glistenplus.com. I'll, ju I'll just jump in because my number five is available right now for people to watch. And it was one I was really looking forward to. I didn't know much about it. Heard it was getting a redo. It's been put on Screenbox and it's about to come out on Blu-ray. It is called Door. It is a Japanese film. There's a, a couple sequels that aren't, you know, exactly the same. Uh, by someone called Ben Mai Takahashi from 1988. This movie is so freaking rad. It is like everything you would watch this and go, oh yeah, Elric is going to love this. It is a uh, mom uh, who, who is married, but the husband's never there. He's always working basically in a high rise apartment. She has a young son and it's basically just about being a mom. And uh, she starts getting all these calls by marketing people and phone calls. And it's very just like, okay, okay, okay. She's just trying to get through it and back to her day. But somebody is calling and getting a little weirder uh, in his kind of conversations with her. And eventually uh, a guy comes to sell her something. He is putting a hard sell on her. And she has the little door thing with the uh, chain. And he puts his hand through to hand her something. And she slams the door on his arm to be like, get the fuck out of my house. Right? Like totally like she should. 
and he takes it very personally and then he becomes completely obsessed with her and starts stalking her at this house and it becomes this like literally i described it it is if chantal ackerman who you know was at the the jitu you know the movie about a woman doing domestic thing was was making repulsion it would be this movie because it's this very much about the domesticity and being alone and lonely even though you're married and have a child you're still lonely you're not alone but you're lonely and it kind of charts that and then this guy comes in and starts crazy behavior in the last act i won't say where it goes but there is a sequence just as a anyone interested in filmmaking in the last few minutes of this they do something there's a shot in taxi driver where it's kind of uh the camera's on something some sort of construct looking straight down so you almost look like you're looking down at a maze and it goes around there's a scene that pushes that so i've never quite do what this does in, in quite a long sequence and it is i was just like all right you just, my jaw just dropped in like you know this movie rules so highest recommendation it is on screen books right now i just watched it and i completely loved it i know i'll watch the sequel somehow and they won't be like this one i don't think um so i've heard so many people talking about this that this just came out of nowhere as this like deep cut nobody has seen and i hadn't heard of it and then i started i think brad henderson or somebody was working on the blu-ray and then i found out that it was going to come out first to screenbox so i was like hell mm -hmm. yes so door put it on your list you will love it and my first one is fucking bonkers but that's why it's on my list is i had never seen anything like this before i probably never will again to the point of i had never even heard a story like this um, and this is Tilbury, That's right. which is a made-for-TV Icelandic horror film from 1987, directed by Vior Vikingsson. <laughs> I hope I said that right. Um, and the concept, I watched this, so it is on, I believe this is on the um, the folk horror yeah, box Woodlands. set that Severin yep. put out, Woodland. Dark. I saw it on Shudder, but it's now also streaming on Tubi. And it's a whole, like, hour long, so have at it. And see just the most bonkers what the fuck movie ever that I have watched this year. And I am not up on my Icelandic folk stories. So this is apparently a well-known Icelandic folk story where if in times of famine you are starving, you can take a human rib. So you're going to have to unearth a corpse, take a human rib um you wrap it in wool you consecrate it and then you have to carry it in between your boobs for a while <clears throat> suddenly this impish thing called a tilbury will it will grow into this it will grow into this impish thing called a tilbury and you will grow a nipple on your thigh by which you can feed the tilbury but the tilbury itself will go steal milk from other farmers cattle and sheep and goats whatever you milk and then it will bring it back to you puke it up but you'll get all the milk that you need and so your family won't starve and so it's some type of very complicated witchcraft demonic thing just to get milk so yeah um but that said it is now set in a war and there's all of these different warring factions and they have taken over their they both set up bases in iceland so we've got american and british setting up bases in iceland and uh and this woman there who has a tilbury and it is posing as a general or some type of commander in i think it's the british forces it is just bonkers like i can't even describe this it's not scary as much as it is just I've never heard a story like this and it's wild and it is gross and just wacky so yeah I um watched this mostly with my mouth dropped open because I just never had seen a story like this so Icelandic horror made for TV movie from 1987 Tilbury hey it's on Tubi right now so if you're looking for something vastly different that you have never seen before Tilbury. All right. Yeah, I still need to see that one. I, I'm very curious. Uh, but it's a best segue in the history of our show, potentially from your milk uh, about milk to a movie where the milk has some sort of poison in it. In my movie, which is a film called Impulse, which there's a lot of movies called Impulse. This is from 1984. This movie is a fantastic. Somebody described it uh, on uh, Letterboxd as the crazies in slow motion, which is a perfect oh. way to describe it. It's basically a small earthquake hits this little quiet town. Uh, and then it cuts to Meg Tilly, who's living in New York or somewhere, and she gets a call from her mom, and on the phone, her mom's yelling at her, who doesn't usually yell at her, and then shoots herself 
in the head and she has to go home and she gets there and she realizes why is mom acting crazy she's still alive but not not well obviously and then we start to realize all the people are starting to act really weird in this town and they basically don't have impulse control and that can be very dark in some people's case it can be odd and funny uh hume crone from cocoon is like the uh the local doctor and there's a really fucked up scene with him bill paxton's her younger brother and he's all pervy and weird and so she's come back with her boyfriend and they're trying to like navigate what's going on in this town and it has some incredible set pieces like it's definitely a directed bigger movie has been, it didn't get a big real it didn't end up getting a great release at the time but it has these set pieces that are just like really impressive of people losing their shit basically um but i i it was a total revelation to me like a couple friends of mine really liked this film and told me about it and i just i just think it's a great movie um highest wreck tracking this one down and you know, it's somewhat about the uh, poison milk, but really, it's, it's it's I think it's looking at just what would happen in society if people didn't curb their impulses, uh, aka Twitter the movie, uh, which is exciting. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that is uh, Impulse from '84. Okay, next up on the list for me, Dementia, 1955. I know you had already seen this one. I had not. This was the first oh, time oh, watching this yes, year. Yes, yes, yes. The My noir one. Second, yeah. No worries. This is 1955 directed by John Parker. I watched this. Oops, sorry. My phone's ringing. I watched this on Screenbox. I'm not sure if it's still there, but I think I watched this one on Screenbox. This is, again, it's a shorter one. This is like under an hour, I want to say, because it's made as an experimental noir movie. Really, really fucking good. Yeah. Um, so this, it's about a woman who lives by herself and she is in a very urban environment in a big city and she is going out at night and it's basically like her expressionistic journey through the city at night being encountered by these horrible men it's very much like this patriarchal like sociopathic male society and she's stabbing them with a switchblade which you're kind of cheering her on for because you're like yeah stab the mean guys like it's very much like this awful society where she's going to a nightclub and all the guys there are awful and then she's out on the street and she meets the pimp and he's awful and she's just kind of it's like a serial killer slasher from a female perspective shot beautifully in 1955 like this wasn't a thing and I didn't know it's a thing and this is now going to be a hefty inclusion in my horror history class because this is predating so much because it is all about the female being like you know just the the gaze and her as a killer like we still do not have female serial killers in horror films so this was just an amazing film that i really recommend super expressionistic and beautifully shot yeah it's it's a really um experimental nightmare it feels like you're watching a nightmare that's a noir that's a feminist mm -hmm. treatise it's like it's really not like any movie i've ever seen prior to that yeah I'm, yeah. I'm with you on that one. Um, okay, my number three, I don't know if I actually brought up on our show, but it was in my, um, we did an all-nighter planned for the other show, uh, Pure Cinema, and this made it, and I love this movie. It's called The Corruption of Chris Miller. It is a mm -hmm. Spanish uh, Jala, which there are only a couple, a handful of, and it's really good. Juan Antonio Bardem from 75, and this has uh, from Breathless Jean Seberg, the French, oh, American actress who, uh, you know, died young. Uh, FBI kind of drove her uh, a little cray. Uh, Marisol, who was a child actress, uh, which is a very strange performance style. Anyway, these two, it's basically two women in an isolated mansion. They, uh, one is the stepmother, uh, Jean Seberg's the stepmom uh, to, the, to this, you know, 20-something uh, gorgeous woman. And they are pretty competitive about their looks and etc. And the husband has disappeared. And the father, he's the husband and the father, has just disappeared and they don't, they're kind of dealing with the aftermath. No clue where he is. He just hasn't returned home after weeks and weeks and weeks. And they have a weird relationship. It's even got scenes where it goes almost sexualized and it's very odd between these two women. Uh, it's shot phenomenal it's just like one of the best looking movies it's so good um i mean i put this in top tier maybe even top 10 giallos i've seen it that's how good this movie is um in the opening scene before you meet these guys you see a guy dressed as charlie chaplin in a house and he's obviously been like somebody's been helping around the yard of this very rich woman and he brutally hacks her to death and it's one of the weirdest openings because he's dressed like charlie chaplin uh then it comes to these two women and a young man shows up and you don't know if he's this killer or not. And he shows up and he wants to start working for some money because he's kind of just passing through. And he starts working there, starts sleeping with the older one, but then crushing on the younger one. And it becomes a whole, uh, as you would expect, that kind of a love triangle. 
and then it shows you a seeth wielding maniac going into the local town Ooh. killing Wait, what did you just say? A, a she, 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 I can't even say it now. Scythe. 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 I would say sickle. Seeth. Sickle. Anyway, yeah. Uh, uh, a big sickle, <laughs> but it's this incredible like raincoat with a sickle and a mask and it's it's on the cover of the vinegar syndrome disc and goes into the town and like massacres a family and so from that moment on you're like is this the guy staying with them or not you don't know and it builds to a wild kind of conclusion in the house it is one of the one of the top movies i've seen this year in terms of like style and um just you know still pretty underknown even though now there is at least a really good release from vinegar syndrome but i i still haven't heard enough people talking about it you would love it like you were gonna think it's top tier of these types of movies uh, so that is Corruption of Chris Miller? Corruption of Chris Miller. And it has, for a long time, it was on Shutter. I don't know if it still is. Excellent. Okay, so the next one, I can't believe I am including this in my top picks of the year, but honestly, it was one of my favorite watches just because it was so goddamn fun. Children of the Corn 3. Oh, now I'm definitely going to have to see it. <laughs> Harvest. Holy shit, it was just a fun film. It was like those Amityville ones where, you know, I kind of tune out and then suddenly one comes along and I'm like, that was actually a really good movie. Or like Brian Usna's Silent Night, Deadly Night inclusions where I'm just kind of like, it was really fucking watchable and fun. Children of the Corn 3. Mind you, I have not seen a lot of the Children of the Corn sequels, but I was at Trivia a couple of months ago and somebody was like, oh my God, you have to see three. It's amazing. And I went home that night and watched three. And I agree. It's just really fun in a really fun sequel kind of way. Okay. So, and then you realize it's directed by um, James D.R. Hickox, which makes Mm -hmm. sense. Like that's, it's a good um, match for this from 1995. So much like the Amityville sequels where they started removing furniture from the Amityville Mm -hmm. house, and then you're going to follow the lamp and then you're going to follow the dollhouse or the clock or whatever. Um, In this case, you're following the kids. So by part three, they have broken up the children of the corn cult and all of the kids that were in. In uh, Gatlin, I can't even remember the name of the original town, Gatlin, and they have decided to um, adopt them out to all of these different people. And so a brother, two brothers from the original Children of the Corn cult have now been adopted by a couple living in inner city Chicago. And they get there and one of the brothers, the older brothers, is immediately like, man, that was some crazy cult shit we went through, but I'm here and I'm going to make the best of it and I'm joining the basketball team and getting a girlfriend. While the other one, the younger one, goes like full Malachi and is like, I'm going to continue the lessons I learned in Gatlin and starts, um, he has seeds left over from the corn that they used to grow. So he finds an abandoned factory lot, a couple of buildings over from his house, and he starts growing the corn there. And he starts recruiting high school students from inner city Chicago to join his weird corn cult. And then we've got killer corn because the corn comes to fucking life and starts killing people people as well and it's done surprisingly well this was it was just fun like don't think about it just enjoy it in much the way that you would like you know amityville it's about time it's just a fun don't worry about how it relates back to the original it was just a weird fun movie children of the corn three urban harvest i wonder if i should watch two first I don't think I don't I've, think, seen I've two, never but, seen two. You know. I've never seen two. I just went straight into three because it was like Dick or Parker yeah. or somebody were like, it's a great movie. It is. It's fine. No, I've heard multiple you and Dick, a couple other people have mentioned it this year. Um, so cool. this one, um, I believe I paid like $2 to rent this on Amazon. All right. Uh, my number two is a trapped on VHS title and apparently one of the rarest uh, in VHS circles, one of the films that people try to collect and pay exorbitant amounts for because there aren't many i didn't know any of that i just saw a girl running in the desert on the cover and i was like whoa what's this movie uh really bad copies that i was able to see on youtube and stuff it's kind of sad because i want to see this look good it is the ultimate vinegar syndrome type movie like if they get their hands on this this will be the ultimate release it's called mirage i talked about pretty recently on our deep and i loved it and i I don't know what it is because it's not necessarily good it's definitely well made as it goes it's it's kind of like uh so it opens it opens very noticeably in the middle of 
like the dry desert uh a truck driving along very fast there's no driver at the wheel they've put something on the pedal and they're making love in the back of the truck and it's just two hot blonde people uh you know 20 year olds just going at it and it's a really kind of funny goofy opening but then once they get out to the middle I mean, we're talking middle of the desert there's no cover in this movie it's very weird that they're going to meet their friends and have a party in the middle of the day it's a very odd thing because it's like there is literally no cover uh and it's a daytime horror which i always love good daytime horrors uh and they hang out with their other friends there they're all getting there there's some weird jealousies they play football almost like the room or something there's one scene that's very goofy even though it's a little sexy or something and at that point i'm like okay i guess i th- i know what this is and then suddenly it becomes joyride in the desert and basically a black truck that they think is a mirage with a guy all in black you can't see his face you don't know who it is starts menacing them and from there on the way it's shot even is just so well comp- every shot so well composed and kind of aggressive it's somewhere between that and duel you know duel it has a lot of the kind of duel mm-hmm. ideas but it's all in the desert as this guy starts picking them off one by one or doing terrible things but there's there's a very standout like a guy buried to his head in the desert and the truck just coming full force at him and it's like stuff like that where you're like oh shit this has suddenly got really real and kind of builds to a little bit of a whodunit kind of but not really and a kind of final showdown that was just very memorable and so this is one of those movies that when you see it you're like oh now i get why probably this has had a big falling i just had never heard of it and if it ever gets a good release clearly it's going to make some waves for people to get excited because it's a slasher film that is stylish and in a unique location so one of my favorites, uh, my favorite, my favorite discoveries tend to be the one that I knew nothing about. Even if other people did, I just stumble across an image. I push play and I'm like, oh, shit, I love this. This is great. So that's Mirage. Um, I'm sure some good VHS collectors will tell me this has been their like all time, you know, number one hope for Blu-ray. But um, yeah, I, I really dug it. And and you can see it out there. It just won't look great. Yeah. Um, okay, so my number two is one that a lot of people have, I think you have seen, it was on Shutter this year, but it is just, it's, it's ridiculously underseen. Like this has honestly become one of my top five favorite giallos ever, which is a big freaking deal when I look at it and go, okay, this deserves to be up there with like a tenembre. And that is Footprints on the Moon, oh, yeah. 1975 by Luigi Bazzuni. The setup of this is this woman, um, she works as a translator. She wakes up and she was supposed to be on vacation, but she has no memory of it. Like her her work calls and is like, are you coming back to work? And she's like, I wait, what day is it? And she has no recollection of where she's been. She just knows that she was supposed to be on vacation, but she's basically lost three days time. And she finds something in her pocket that says that she had gone to the seaside town. And so she travels to this town. She takes another day off from work and she's like, I'm real fuzzy. I need to figure out what's going on. She travels to the seaside town that she finds this thing in her pocket that indicates that she was there. And she gets there and everyone knows her and talks about her like she's been there for a while and she interacted with all these people but they know her under a different name and they all tell her about these things that she did she has no memory of it whatsoever so she starts but they know her with a different hair color and under a different name and all these like how mean she was and things like that and she starts trying to piece together what is going on All the while, she is having these really trippy flashes to a couple of different things, including a movie that she watched. You get the idea that it's a movie, but it might be kind of a dream that she had about astronauts on a moon, on the moon. Um, And Klaus Kinski is one of them. And the whole thing is really trippy and wild the way that it kind of unfolds and you realize what's going on with her. And yeah, but the setup, the premise is so tight. And then the movie just keeps getting tighter as it goes along. Like if that hook wasn't enough, it gets even wilder. I had never heard of this before it popped up on Shutter, And I think that it was, I read Sam Zimmerman, I think posted something on Instagram and like, this is one of my favorite movies and it's finally coming to Shutter, And I watched it based off that. And yeah, this is now one of my favorite Giallo films that no one has ever heard of. So 1975 Footprints on the Moon is fucking great. Well, if you listen to me, I think it was my number one either I last year or the year before, sure. but it was yeah, one of my number was- ones. That and Perfume and the Lady in Black have become mm-hmm. two of my favorites of the subgenre of the kind of the house of psychotic woman type, you know, female yeah. character. Because I, I agree with, I think it's an incredible 
incredible movie and that i kind of became obsessed with the director because they if you look at they didn't make many movies but the fifth chord which is a beautifully shot jello so gorgeous. and then one that a lot of people i still haven't seen but it's an arrow disc and i think you would dig it a lot it's kind of jello but kind of like a weird dark drama called the possessed which is not about possession but it's about a small town and like an obsession and it, but it's it's shot as well all of these movies are just shot so well um yeah. but anyway yeah no that's i'm glad you really like that one because that makes sense and hopefully yeah. you'll listen to this next one because my number one is one that i've tried to tell you to watch now this will be the third time because i know that you are gonna oh gosh you mean like you tell me for years yeah. to watch something and i don't do it and then i suddenly it's watch so it annoying. and pretend that no one ever told me so about annoying. it yeah, it's really so annoying, annoying. Yeah. oh my god it's definitely a one-way street um i i can't think of it. name one title i've ever done that to um I'm, I'm okay you hold just on. forget titles. drop dead gorgeous yeah but that's that uh, makes sense because it's comedy and, you know. it doesn't no i could do this i could do okay. this for hours anyway, this one you'll remember though because i have been pointedly telling you spe this is specifically you that i think we'll get something out of this uh but this was my favorite surprise of the year for me it was called cyclops it was by this guy joji lida you did tell yeah, me yeah. to watch this uh it's i believe only really available for, i think there is some sort of disc in the works uh but it's on something called archive.org pretty good version uh, it's only 52 minutes and it basically the basic sell would be like it feels like a, a Japanese version of scanners uh, made in 87 but with practical effects that are as good as like the fly um, it's you kind of just jump into this world it moves real fast and you just jump into this kind of corporate world where and medical world where basically probably because the atmosphere or because of like post nuclear stuff like some humans have just developed weird birth defects and are kind of you know mutants but it's all done very subtly it's the opposite of that movie you love with the crazy what's that one called the crazy japanese um you know where they've got gozu no the one with the crazy they, they've got crazy body parts and machine guns and like oh tokyo Gore yeah, so this is like that this is why i think you'll like this it is that kind of a movie in the subtle cronenberg version of that movie uh mm, the more real okay. the realistic kind of grounded version but so you meet these people there's a brother who's trying to you know basically cure some of these issues but it's done so subtly that the first 30 minutes you're you're aware you're watching a genre film but it's just a lot of medical talk there's this one guy's always wearing sunglasses and then at some point somebody reaches up grabs his sunglasses off and you realize he's like a freaking mutant cyclops thing and it's done like a Cronenberg film and it's like oh shit and he's got kind of strength and stuff it's a movie that kind of builds like oh they're trying to abduct this girl because they know she has some of these powers and they want to like experiment on her and it basically all culminates in a hospital and you know I was just watching it going this is pretty cool and subtle and they get in an elevator and suddenly crazy body horror i mean just the most wild wow. realistic but also grotesque body horror stuff starts going and these these people who look normal for the first 40 minutes suddenly break out into ways that you weren't expecting and i wouldn't even be able to really recount it if i tried but it had some of the moments where i was like okay i actually have never seen somebody achieve it quite this well and, and in this and i think it might have been for a tv type thing and maybe it was planned to be more of a series or something but it never happened mm -hmm. and it's absolutely unmissable for people who like this kind of horror especially if you like Cronenberg and body horror this is an absolute must one word cyclops so where can i see this? i think it was archive.org i sometimes find very good that's like a legit site a lot of um kind of asian cinema sometimes pops up there for whatever reason and it's you know a legit normal site that anyone could access um and i but i believe because i saw somebody maybe it was brad henderson post a still after I'd seen it, just saying, you know, oh, looking at the restoration or something. So fingers crossed. Okay. Okay. So my number one, I was watching on a plane on the way back from Knoxville the whole time, taking my headphones out occasionally going, oh my God, this is so fucking good. How has no one seen this? And it was Mr. Frost from 1990. Um, I did not have a legal version of this, I don't think, because um, I had downloaded it from somebody who gave me like access to their drive. This is a hard one to find. I'm sure if you dig enough on YouTube or something like that, it's just, it's a hard one to find now. I have no clue why this has never had a good release. This is Jeff Goldblum. And I mean, he is so goddamn good in this. He is chilling. Like I could never picture what Jeff Goldblum as a serial killer would be he's fucking terrific it was astounding it was from 1990 the setup 
two kids. There is this beautiful estate, this beautiful, beautiful, lush estate. And you know that one person lives there, Jeff Goldblum. These kids break into his garage and they are trying to steal his like Aston Martin car, his like really nice car. And while they're trying to do it, they find a body. And they take off and they head straight to the police department. And then the next day, Jeff Goldblum is sitting there by himself in a suit, sipping his brandy. And a cop shows up and it's like, look, these like kids were trying to break into your garage last night. I'm sorry about that. They're delinquents, but they swear that you have a body and I have to investigate and it's probably nothing. And he very calmly goes, oh, I was about to bury that one. Or I just buried that one. And the cop is like, wait, what? And he's like, Jeff Goldblum very calmly says, do you want me to dig it back up for you? And then very calmly confesses that he's killed 23 people who are buried on his property and that the cops are welcome to it. And he is turning himself in. And that is the cold open. That is the first 10 minutes of the movie. It then flashes to a number of years later. He was in prison. But they have now deemed him criminally insane. And so he has been moved from a prison. He has not spoken anything since the day he was arrested. He has not said a word. And they have deemed him criminally insane. He has been moved from the prison into a mental hospital. And it is about this new female doctor who is trying to get him to talk and trying to get to the bottom of who he is. No one can figure out anything about him. He has no background. They don't even know what his full name is or how he got this house. The only name that he has ever gone by is Mr. Frost. And so she is now trying to figure out who he is, his backstory, all inside this mental hospital, all while weird shit starts happening within the mental hospital as well. Like almost like a supernatural edge to it. This was so tight, so good. How has this not gotten a decent release? It is beyond me. It was directed by this guy named um, Felipe Setbon, who previously had done um, some arty kind of arty French films is how I'll put it. And a lot of French action films. I do not know a lot of his work. So yeah, this, it's just tight. Not really available it's like, anywhere. I think it's like the Mirage one I saw in the sense that the, I remember the VHS cover of this. And I have, I think anytime you look up articles saying movies trapped on VHS, Mr. Frost is like legendarily not available. I don't. Yeah. So it must be for a bigger reason when you have a star like Jeff Goldblum, it must be. Uh, yeah. Usually if, if it's something like this, it's that no one knows who owns the movie. And so everybody is scared to release it for fear that, you know, we think we own it, but we're not 100% sure. And we're scared to release it because we might get sued or that somebody owns it and just doesn't care and doesn't feel compelled to release it. So this it's an amazing film. If you ever have now. the chance to see this movie, it's great. Yeah, no, I had so, a copy Mr. Frost. about a year or two ago, like when we were first started deep, because I think I found one I and I just hadn't watched it yet. So I'm glad you are uh selling it so i i got it yeah it was and even posting it on my socials it was endless dozens of comments after comments of people just holy shit this movie is so good this is like gold bloom's best work mm. how is this not how to release like it is astounding well they are for it. sure wrong because the fly exists so <laughs> that is true that is true i won't step on the fly but it's great cheeseburgers okay do you have any runner up uh not for this show because otherwise we'd be a three-hour show oh that's true that is we'll true and we're not, we're not doing that anymore that. We, this, we, we did pretty good those. we might not be in an hour but we did pretty good this is the, yeah, this, this is, is us turning a new leaf us. so that's good uh so but but if you enjoyed <laughs> that the, that us diving into those kind of titles definitely check out deep cuts uh on our patreon because that is where we do that every week and we'll be that doing is, one uh, next is, week yeah, next week we, oh gosh, I got to go watch some stuff for that. Just when I thought I'd escaped Halloween. No. Actually, I love watching deep cuts. That is always my jam is, what do you mean this isn't available anywhere? And it's like from, you know, some Icelandic horror film. That's still. I'm already ready. I, I've, I've watched yeah, three or recently. Um, but anyway, thank you for uh, joining and thank you for jumping in and uh, making our new version of the show. I love to sculpt as we, as we record. <laughs> The Colors of the Dark podcast is a Fangoria production. Producers and co-hosts are Rebecca McKendry and Elric Kane. Executive producers are Tara Ainsley and Abby Gould. Sonic branding by Michael Rodriguez. And, of course, our amazing sound engineer, Ernie Hurtado. 